Right, a very good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to National Library's prominent speaker series. Our speaker tonight, a mother of three, and a grandmother of another three. Yes, clap your hands, please. Yes, thank you. She's the co-founder of Bainan Tree Hotels and Resorts, a leading developer and manager of premium resorts, urban hotels, and destination spas around the world. She is Senior Vice President of Banya Tree Holdings Limited and Chairperson for China's China Business uh, Development. She also chairs Banya Tree Global Foundation Limited, responsible for directing and guiding the evolving process of the group's commitment to corporate social responsibility and its mission to enhance the environment, empower the people, Claire is also founder and executive director of a Banyan Tree Gallery, where she pioneered Banyan Tree Group's um, retail businesses and oversaw the launch of over 70 retail outlets worldwide. Ms. Claire is one of the first uh, two women to be admitted to the Singapore Chinese Chamber of Commerce and Industry in 1995 and holds directorships in the Wildlife Reserve Singapore, Conservation Fund, and Mandai Park Holdings. And for her advocacy in social issues, Ms. Chang has won national and international awards, including the Public Service Medal in 2008, Public Service Star BBM in 2014, for her contribution to implementing work-life integration in Singapore. And in 2016, she received NUS Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences Distinguished Arts and Social Sciences Alumni Award. She was awarded Friend of the Arts by the National Arts Council in year 2017 for her contribution towards the advancements and promotions of cultural and artistic activities in Singapore. And of course, she's married to Group Executive Chairman Mr. Ho Kwon Ping, with whom she received the Hospitality Lifetime Achievement Award at the China Hotel Investment Summit in 2009. So please join me as I welcome Ms. Claire Chan. Hello, everyone. That was a long introduction, and I just hope that, you know, uh, you find out for yourself who Claire is. So when, when people ask me to um, make a talk like this and I ask what you'd like to know, and they always ask, said, you know, uh, what makes you successful? My reply has always been, I'm still getting there. I don't feel that success. And what made me the way I am is life itself. These 68 years of experiences in learning, doing, giving, living, and growing. Like every one of you, that is life in itself that made you the way you are, and you are each one as successful. I belong to the Medica generation. I changed the title earlier, the romance of travel, to the Medeca spirit, because I don't think, who are the Medecans here? Wow. Less than 10 pair of hands. You mean the rest are pioneers? No. And the rest are the post Medeca. So I belong to the Medeca generation. At the time with Singapore, was only 1 million point 50. I checked a baby boomer, and life was a little better than the pioneer generation who endured the hardships of World War II. We went through a tumultuous period, for sure. Led to the independence in 1965. I grew up in little India. There were secret societies on the next road. I saw gang fights. I saw women pulled off the roads, out of the bar, and um, it was not easy growing up in the 50s, but there was a sense of kampong, a sense of optimism and hope. But the scarcity in the economy um, 
made us so careful and prudent about everything we owned and we own so little. It makes recycling, it makes conservation so much a natural habit in my own life because of the scarcity of economy that we grew up in. So in years later, when I launched the sustainability program in Banyan Tree and uh, steered the Banyan Tree Global Foundation based on conservation, it was just a natural translation of my childhood habits. We treasure the little we had. Life then at Medeka era was targeted, focused, bent on getting school grades and to university that serve as a ticket to a good career. I remember at O level and at, uh, in A levels, I worked every vacation to get the extra dollars for relief teaching. And I think we were given like $8 for, for, for the day, um, but there was a lot of money. I carried within me 120 years of family legacy. My grandmother, born in 1898, migrated from Hainan Island, China, to Johor to join her husband as a rubber tapper. Uneducated and widowed a few years later after a bee killed my grandfather, she followed her son, my father, to Singapore. Her stoic purpose was survival and keeping the family together. Stepping out of Hainan Island flamed her revolution from within just like millions of other women who left their hometowns to migrate to a new possibility. Singapore was that beacon of hope and a new beginning. My mother was born in Malacca, and later in 1930s, both mother and daughter moved to Singapore after my grandfather abandoned them. She had to quit school to sell bread on the streets and later worked in a laundry. She met my father, who was a teacher by night and an office clerk by day, and they went through the upheavals in pre-independence and nation-building years and raised six of us children with a tight fist by stretching every dollar to its worth to provide us shelter and protection. Her challenging circumstances hardened up to teach us that no one owed us a living. She resonated the ethos of one of the earlier campaigns I remembered best in Singapore, that of a rugged society. That was a period of resilience, toughness, and endurance. We believed in hard work, and we did our best. Pragmatics, as wife and mother, while brokering property sales, my mother got us a little shop house with two rooms, Quite a vast improvement from the one room in a long house 10 of us used to all stay in. Besides her many talents, what I found revolutionary about her was her focus on education. She made me attend two schools in one day, a Chinese school to keep my traditional values and an English school to ensure my ticket to a good career. Against the then back cultural backdrop which regarded daughters that I was the only daughter in the house, I grew up with five other boys. I was regarded as the throwaway water. Poor Cho Chi Australia. Her investment in me was a strong commitment I owed a lot to. Those formative years in Chinese language tra training served me well today in my role in business development in China. I remember standing upright during school assemblies in the 50s to receive the message from the Queen of England and Commonwealth, on Commonwealth Day, and sang Nagara Ku, the Malayan national song, before I sang our own independent songs, Majula, Singapore, in 1965. We were the first batch of beneficiaries of post-independence in this city-state, 1965, of 1 1.8 million people, motivated by purpose and growth. I enjoyed the schools I went to, Nanhua Primary School, Raffles Girls Primary School and Secondary School, National Junior College and the Singapore University. The city-state then was not wealthy or secure. As a child, we experienced water rationing regime and I remember queuing in public areas for the public taps for water. My brothers and I would each carry a pail of water home and 
this pail is for clothes, this pail is for food, and then we will fight over the use of water. My brother and I walked to school and lived with scarcity by stretching the dollar to maximize its value. And in those times, a bowl of noodles is just 10 cents. No more today. But we never felt poor. I never did, or deprived. We had so many ways to entertain ourselves as children. I caught spiders, I played goalie. I, was, I grew up with five brothers and five younger male cousins. I was the queen of 10 boys. That, ex that explained a little more of the roughness in the, that you see in me, that a bit of the tomboyish. That's why I grew long hair and wear long skirts so that I can be a little bit more feminine. We, I learned early in life, in my upbringing, to get on with living, that we own the duty to deliver our best to create value in life. This parenting guidance and discipline propelled me to study hard and excel in school and to engage in various activities to improve my abilities and understand what mattered. To today, I'm committed to self-agency. No one owes you a living. To make things happen and to first change myself. To uphold marriage and family values as, an, as enablers in fostering resilience to supporting community through a mutually giving Gotong Royong spirit that draws people together, and to serving the country with care as a personal duty. I live the ethos I grew up in in little India. I called it the Medeka spirit. My daughter, born 1985, adept with internet and all things electronic, grew up in a safe sister state of three to four million people while enjoying its economic growth by tapping on the digital technology and all the IOTs, the Internet of Things. The many choices also bring conflict, as there's no longer the one right path to follow. So in this snapshot, four women in my life, 120 years of legacy, my grandparents' fight was for survival. My parents' determination to progress. Mine was about equality and quality improvement. And my daughter's is for personal control and self-actualization. And now, the fifth generation, my little granddaughter, called Sonnet, one year old, her cyber future will be amazingly fantastical, possibly alien to people in my generation. Her battle will be finding her inner sanctuary and to focus on her humanity in the flux of Internet of Things. I worry. I will quote from an essay written in 2015, my daughter, who is now a mother of, at 34 years old, who had this to say about me and the future. And some of you, I think, are at that same age or will also feel that contradiction, she wrote. At my wedding, I thanked my mother for two things. The first was fighting for freedom that I so easily enjoy and that she struggled to have. Luxury is like choosing a path of working for meaning and following a road of self-actualization. The second was the lesson of what meant to have it all as a woman. She taught me to define my own version of success, that having it all means finding that fit between your own values, ambition, and relationships. There are many similarities in the paths we have taken, but each generation fights for the priorities of their time. I feel that the young women in my generation are often at a loss where to place our priorities. We have a multitude of choices, but not necessarily the wisdom to choose the order in which to place our stepping stones. My foremothers fought for survival, opportunity, and respect. Our generation's task is to acknowledge the rewards of those hard-worn battles and use them wisely. How will we choose to value our freedom? What choices will we have and for what purpose? What meaning will be derived from our daily work and for whom? What will we fight for? Renyong, my daughter, raised a pertinent problematic, and evidently, there is no straightforward answer. We find the answers by living out 
our lives. Sure, there will be disappointments, but there will also be surprises. I've always perceived women as psychic migrants, people transitioning between the old and the new modes of feeling, thinking, and action, struggling to hold on to the past, yet excited about adjusting to the new ones. In the process, the center of self can be pulled into fragments of consciousness. It's like a spinning prism, dazzling, bewildering, which could distort our judgment and throw us off balance. Like displaced refugees searching for a permanent home, we seek new assurances and confidence. That quest is not easy. And I'm not sure that is only the woman's journey. Equally, I think the men's quest is just as conflicted, contradictory, dazzling, and challenging. I say to my children, to my two sons and daughters, who are 37, 34, and 25 in year, in ages, that in their search for their own uniqueness, there is no formula for sculpting or scripting by parents or by the institutions as right or wrong, self-identity. There's, however, a need to continually search and nurture a self-accepting identity. This self-authorizing confidence in defining our own identity to dare say to the world, I am, reflects a sense of personal control, which for me is a central pillar in fostering positive mental health. It is in itself an inalienable right as a person. Yet the discovery is elusive because the status quo is conformist and conservative and our significant others around us may not be ready for the change. So are you ready to be your own warrior? The silent revolution women had staged in this century was remarkable. It was bloodless, yet yielded significant strides in the way women live, feel, think, and work. And these emerging leaders were going to change and influence the texture of work relationships. This century is going to be the century for women, by women, and of the women. So the men around here learn to adapt. Jimmy is shaking his hands. He'll be the first one I shall influence after tonight. We will have definitely challenges. We will have to make many calculus at different life stages to define ourselves. But it is going to be an exciting time, and with technology's assistance, Facebook, iPad, you can work anywhere, everywhere. You can travel and feel that you are not far away from home. I get so many, I, I travel at least about six months in a year, and people call me and, and I talk normally. Sometimes they wake me up in the middle of the night, but they did not know that I was actually in London or I was in Mos Moscow or I was in Mongolia. All the technology is made appear as though you are still in Singapore working, dialoguing, debating and working with them. I'm going to share a few turning points uh, that transformed my ordinary life. My first turning point was after I got married and moved to Hong Kong, famous little island that we all now know so well. KP and I stepped out of our comfort zone and exposed us to a, a variety of experiences that laid the foundation of our entrepreneurship journeys after us. Why I made this point is, is such an important turning point. Because the latest res sur uh, survey done by a, uh, uh, a big accounting firm found that Singaporeans, compared to their peers, do not like to travel for work and do not like to relocate overseas and do not want to work overseas three years, five years, or 10 years. They just want to stay at home in Singapore. That is really a, a, an issue because it is only, I feel, by going out of this little island, we learn. We adopt an internationalist perspective and when we come back, we are all the better. If there's one word I could describe KP and my journey in marriage and at work, the word is what connects us is ideas. 
IDEA. Our courtship was spiced up in melting pot of ideas. I was trained in sociology, had a great job teaching behavioral science in, to medical students in Hong Kong University. At the same time, I was working for my master's degree in industrial sociology. I married a journalist and a, a tra someone trained in economics. And when we were in Hong Kong in this beautiful island called Lama Island, or precisely the Banyan Cove, that's where we had so much discussions about development, economics, and sociology. Hong Kong people think that Bayan Tree belongs to them because of our association with Namato in Yongshiwan. And there in that little island, there were no road, there were no cars, no vehicles. Everyone called each other by kin name Jie Jie or Go Go or Asam and Apa. The sense of Kampong, the way I felt in little India, was revived again. There was kinship, there was community. And I feel that was the century that captured our imagination. So, and it was on high side, that could very well have been the genesis of Banyan Tree when we styled it as a century for the census. And in those early years, we, we, we traveled a lot in the region, had little money, and so we went on buses and trains and on even bikes and motorcycles. We simply love new discoveries. And that had been important foundation years for both of us in understanding the ecosystems and the geopolitical conditions of the region. And that, and we had so many conversations, so many debates and fights. Those conversations fueled eventually our own maturity and, and also led us to our final vocation, which is the hospitality business and it, that became the theater for our work and play. We were students of development and pluralism. We agonized over contradictions between capital and labor, between profits and justice, between efficiency and equity, between men and women, and those of the state and the citizens. We continually ask what can we do as men and women, as a couple, in our business, and being a little bit more privileged, what can we do when the richest 2% of the world's population own more than 50% of global household wealth? Nearly half have no electricity and live on less than $2 a day. One quarter are illiterate and one fifth have no access to health care and one third of the world's children under the age of five suffer from malnutrition. The figure may be tweaked a little bit, but not far from it. And worse, the woman's condition, 70% of the 900 million adults who cannot read or write are women. 72% of the world's 33 million refugees are women and children. 50% of the food grown worldwide is produced by women, yet they own only 10% of land. 70% of the world's 1.3 billion people living in absolute poverty are women. So the founder of Grameen Bank and Nobel Prize winner 2006, Muhammad Yunus, had said that poverty is not created by the people themselves. Poverty has been created by the economic and social system that we have designed for the world. Capitalism has created ambition, which people may not know where to focus and how to focus it. We have to find better ways. KP and I both found in hospitality business as a platform for our transformation and growth. The second turning point was an unfortunate one. On December 26, 1988, six months through my pregnancy of my third child, after a delightful Christmas dinner and a walk on Orchard Road to enjoy the Christmas lights with my two children, my water bag bursted and I was rushed to the hospital, admitted to intensive care. Over the next four weeks, I could not lie down. I was simply sitting up for four weeks to uh, prevent the water from flowing out. The doctor did all he could to save the lives of both mother and child. I was bleeding my nose and gum due to the intravenous medication pumped into me to arrest the 
contraptions. The fight was finally lost in January 19. I survived, but my baby was lost. I was devastated. I had this tremendous feeling that I had failed as a woman. I felt such guilt. I had not wanted my baby enough and therefore it left me. That's how I felt. It was very hard hitting for me because no one understood. It was a third child, so everyone said. It's a miscarriage, the thing happens. But that's not how I saw it. No words would comfort me. It was my blood and I had failed it. I was then in NUS. I entered into a severe depression. I closed down and rejected the world. I literally was not able to speak to anyone because words failed me. I went to a sign language school and I began healing in a world of silence. Time is the best teacher in grief. Months passed and I tried to make sense of the loss of the baby and what I had done to deserve it. I nominated myself to be a volunteer in SOS, Samaritan of Singapore. I was able to persuade the counselors well, that you know, with the pain that I have, I might be able to empathize with those in pain who are looking for support. For four years, I served on the hotline, hearing about other people's issues, fears, and delusions. I began to realize the problems were so often about being enslaved to a perception of who we are as people. We tell stories about I am this and I am that. Much of my training and work afterwards and today is about helping people find other ways of thinking about themselves. I was whining in my own failure and lost sense of womanhood. But when I hear another woman's story, the misfortune, the miscarriage, the domestic violence, my problem became so little. So I switched my mindset from one based on the question, why me, to another that asked instead, why not me? This shift in mindset from being a victim to one of a greater one that accepts the condition helped to transform my perspective in life. I realized that I'm just one of the zillion people, so why should I not be the one of the few who suffer this experience? Why am I so special? It was humbling and reductionist, surely, but it was incredibly liberating. It helped me to walk away from my imprisoned self and to embrace the world once more. Although I continue to feel the pain till today, on every January the 19th, I began to find the way of loosening the grip it had on me. The journey of activism afterwards I embarked on helped to substitute the painful memories with new, more positive ones. I joined AWARE, I joined Society Against Family Violence, Chinese Chamber of Commerce, and served two terms in NMP while starting up with KP, a family business. It was sure work and work to minimize the pain. This sharing is to encourage you to believe there are opportunities all around us, but sometimes we just do not see them. Our mindset about all things is so important that we have to look for the connections and the possibilities in front of us. From why me to why not me, I emerge to say, it's me. I became more centered in who I am and what I believe in. I'm more accepting of myself and I, can, and I can bring to the world some value. We should be continually looking to feedback our experiences, to build on our foundations, to move and learn from our experiences. This is a lifelong journey of learning, unlearning, relearning. A lot of you are going to live till 120 years old, judging from the latest statistics, so that it's going to be a long journey of learning. And in my journey, the foundation years of Medeca values, which I was committed to, have been the underlying fuel for my community activism and leadership. I did all that I did because I believe importance of self-agency, no one owes your living, the value of marriage, family, community, 
Values in the end are the ultimate freedom foundations, and you find them in living your way. I look for harmonizers, those values that bring us together rather than tear us apart. Those values, openness, compassion, inclusiveness, honesty, justice, and honor. They bring good to the world. They are about sharing and about unity. It's not competition. It's not who gets ahead first. It's not being number one. It's not being always just the best and only the best. As in all selection process, we find the channels that fit for purpose. KP and I found in tourism and hospitality what we are good at. I love to compose programs and business models. I'm a woman on the move through travels. I'm fundamentally a teacher at home and at work. In short, it is through embracing all that is available out there that I can be me, the Claire of Singapore. So I live as a humanist in a responsible way. And if I could speak in financial terms, don't look at money as capital. You are the capital that you can sharpen. I am the capital that I can maximize and multiply myself as best as I can. I'm so grateful for all the inspirations visiting me time and again, and they drive me towards the cause of my lives. Tonight, I had the pleasure of having some old friends from Anne to Ife to Jimmy and to Paro, all who are much older than me for me to look up to. Thank you for being with me in my journey and thank you for being the role models and the inspirations in my life. Let's give them a round of applause. <laughs> this continuing journey of doing, feeling, and walking the talk, we have to learn, we have to give time to reflect internally to better understand and articulate our motivations and the passions that make us feel most alive. It pains me when young people tell me they dread to go to work. It saddens me when they tell me they do not know what they are in there for. If it's that situation you are in, get out of the job. Pursue anything that brings your heart alive. Because in the end, it is you who have to work, walk the journey. This is the self-empowerment that bring a mindset that leaves us open and ready to be inspired. Life is too short. Don't waste it. A third turning point came quite accidentally. You know, I, I vowed that I will never marry a businessman when I was a child, so never make vows. But I married, I married a journalist, a poor journalist at that. And he turned business through no fault of mine. And soon afterwards, I followed and also became a businesswoman. Life is almost unpredictable, and that's why it's so fun. After this idyllic stay in Hong Kong, and then we returned to Singapore, we went into another level of depression I didn't have a house, I didn't have a job, I was just promoted in Hong Kong Medical University to a senior demonstrator with more thousand dollars onto my pocket. I got a new office, I've got a new home. My father-in-law had a stroke. Now this is a decision I have to make. I leave to, to come home and lost everything that I had, the promotion and my PhD, because I was in a Master's of Philosophy program. In 18 months, I could convert it to a doctorate, which the school wanted me to do. Or I stay in Hong Kong and have the KP, who is a filial son, to come home and risk possibly with distance the marriage. At that time, you know, there was not very clear thinking. And I felt that, you know, we could easily do my PhD again in Singapore or elsewhere. And I should and we were just married, right? And there was also the duty of a daughter-in-law. It was the most difficult dilemma in my life. It was really a crossroad. It was really that pull of me and them. What did I choose? Of course, the rest of the story you knew. I left, and my supervisor, my MFU supervisor, flew down to Singapore 
actually helped me to complete my thesis and encouraged me to convert it to a PhD, which I never did, because the baby then came along. That push factor, that the, the unhappiness with Singapore, uh, not having a job and place, I wanted to find a place where I could spend a weekend. And that's when I, we flew to Phuket to look for a little spot to build my little hut so that on Friday I can fly there, have weekend sanity, and then on Monday, fly back, start the work. And that is where we discovered Laguna, that beautiful sunset, the Casuarina Forest, and a splendid evening. And I said, this is where I need my home to be. Of course, whatever we saw was beautiful. The Blue Lagoon is actually toxic. That's why nobody wanted that piece of land, because it's poison. It is an abandoned tin mine. But foolish, we didn't do our sort analysis. We didn't do our due diligence. We didn't look for experts. We bought it. And that's, that's the thing about business, and that's about something about KP, never giving up. OK, so this is poison, and we could not do anything. Can we go back to the, first, the other slide? What we did was to invite experts in to totally remove the topsoil and rehabilitate Laguna two years. Two years of time, effort, and money. But it has to be done, because we were committed to it. We stayed on course, and now, it has become an in integrated resort with seven resorts and 30 food and beverage outlets, golf course, and a community probably of more than um, 200,000 people. So leadership is really about cumulative experiments and effort. And it is really about seizing the opportunity. This has become, in a way, the uh, sustenance for all the businesses that we have done. We celebrated our 25th anniversary this year, all due to a poor assessment exercise. So it's okay if you actually have grades like E or F, you know, because one day you might become a, a tycoon. So our foolishness, our ignorance, our total lack of professionalism led us to a discovery journey that had paid off well. In that sense, I am grateful. It's a lot of luck, but after the uh, topsoil was being removed, it's a lot more about work. My fourth turning point, which is directly related to the gentleman here, is my encounter with this wonderful lady called Shireen Foster, who fought for the Women's Charter in Singapore. She was in her 80s when I we met. She was selling me two village-made cushions that could help to get a child to school in Thailand. Subsequently, in, in another conference in Hanoi, I learned the importance of handicraft industry and I realized a shared heritage among ASEAN sisters. And if I could help them and take the middlemen off and work directly with the producers, I was able to lift them from poverty and they could therefore benefit from me as a marketeer for their products. The idea of fair wage and honest day work all suddenly make sense to me. So I corporatized a retail arm in our hotel business and served as a marketing platform. And now that Biometric Gallery is 25 years old, we have, I'm operating about 70 outlets globally. Uh, we also are the main procurement source for our hotels, and we have supported 82 community suppliers worldwide and about 127 communities, big and small. And for this work, two cushions changed my life. Shireen Foster changed my life. I'm infinitely grateful to. So when I bought 2,000 cushions from her to decorate our hotels, we supported a village. And afterwards, years later, we supported the building of a school, the uh, Santintam Virayakan School at Yasaton. And I just last week came back from Xi'an, and I went up to the upland to a, a, to a village school. These are children who are left by their parents who had to travel far to work. 
And these are children in the secondary, lower secondary, 13, 14 years old. They stayed in school, and I looked at the condition of the school. They didn't have a toilet, a good toilet. They didn't have a canteen either. So they were standing in the cold to eat. And this is only uh, post-autumn. Winter is coming in December and January. It's been very, very cold. So our hotel, which all of, all, each hotel in our group has to do uh, sustainability and uh, CSR work, has adopted the school to help build a canteen, a toilet, and to supply heating system for the 212 children up in the village. And I invite you all, any of you who are interested to do any vacation teaching, sharing, mentoring, uh, give me your names and I could always connect you because these children were smart but just did not have opportunities. They were able to recite the whole of Di Zhi Gui, and they were absolutely, you know, wonderful. And it, I just felt the pain that there were so little resources. So we have decided to adopt the school and to support it throughout and to give scholarships and to help the children. And it's all a big brother, big sister program with, by, our, by our hotel associates. So it's not philanthropy by just giving money. It's actually adopting them to help them. And that's where I spoke to the mayor when he heard about our program. And he said, now I understand what Banyan Tree does and what social responsibility means and how business can serve a positive role in society and how it can connect communities and societies. So it's very encouraging also for our own staff because they are defending their own stakeholder community. So I'm beginning to see this shift in business discussions and in the big stewardship programs that we do in uh, by Tamasic every year in June. I, I observe this discussion now on stewardship. You don't have to be a capitalist or owner but you are each a steward of this planet and a steward of this country and a steward of your constituency and a steward of your district. Merely means it being responsible for the assets and doubt that gave you what you have and you have to guard it. So stewardship has become an important discussion point and the word on stakeholder capitalism is also gaining momentum over the concept of shareholder Capitalism. It's not about short term, it's about long term. It's not about just a few that make the, great, make the money, it's about how it impacts on the community. So we have done this since the day we started. All this arising, I feel, out of our Medieca spirit, because it was the way I, I grew up in, in the Kampong, and mutual help, and working together as a team, working together as a group, that doing this with the villagers around our, the hotels we operate has become a natural translation of our own values. And that has given me probably the, the, the best satisfaction doing business. And my engagement re realized my dream as a social scientist. I was trained in sociology, yeah? And that I, in that, I, I, that experience, I created the meaning and the partnership value between enterprises and society, between um, governance and execution. I found my role and the respect for business as a positive force of social change. Remember, I started off really disparaging business because of the, what I saw in other, what other businessmen did. Till I went through this experience, I was transformed to see the positive role it can play. Therefore, it's not business per se, it's how you do business, how you operate, how you manage that matters. It's not about wealth creation, it is about value creation. The last turning point was in my NUS days in Center for Advanced Studies when I was appointed a fellow researcher and I spent four years uh, publishing a book called Stepping Out. Some of you may have read it. 
and later on it was made into a movie, a 30 chapter series, and uh, which won uh, five awards. That book, I reviewed the lives of 47 lives, Singapore pioneers, gleaned from 4,500 pages of oral history transcripts. And I weaved a composite story about their goals, failures, and fighting back. It was strangely those four years made me more Singaporean. I suddenly hear the voices because it was all in spools and archives in those days. It was in Cantonese, Hokkien, Teochew, Hakka, Hainanese. I was able to understand all these dialects and I was, I was transcribing each one of them until I got the money to get them transcribed. And then I was translating them to English for the co-writer with me, and then we wrote the book. It was four years of hard work, and I vowed never to write an academic book again. <laughs> and I'm so glad Professor Ediko is not here. He was one of the, my, my teachers at that time. I, and the worst thing was when at the end of the book, I had, I had to send the book for a jury. And I got a thousand questions back to ask me to answer to every comma and every dot and every reference. Academics have nothing better to do. <laughs> but those four years of the research made me Singaporean because I read firsthand the stories of our pioneer generation, our Medeca generation, our contemporary generation. It was a fascinating story. So if you are ever bored with time, please go to the oral history archives and borrow some of the, which is all now into, uh, it's, it's uh, te uh, technical now, right? You can just click and then you can listen. You will, you will love it. You will, you will hear your grandparents, your parents speaking to you. You will sense that self, the making of you as Singaporeans through that journey. And that has been so wonderful for me. And this is a generation of people who was not the click generation. They only came to from, from China with, with a bag of five and five dollars. But they worked, they worked and worked. And the only thing that motivated them, I want to make a difference. And I could make a difference. That is the differentiator. They are my heroes. You know? Reading these stories, and well, if you still could buy this book called Stepping Out, is something that I'm very proud of. It was later on translated to Chinese, and it's a must read in the Social Sciences Academy in Beijing, Guangzhou, Shanghai. And now it is, we are asked to be reprinting it. But in it were the transcripts of my heroes, and that's how I appreciated the making of Singapore. The perseverance the sacrifices, the hard work, and, and, and what is so encouraging was the notion of reciprocity. It keeps in the book the word that appeared the most is about ren, doing good, and about qi shi hui, yong zi shi hui, giving back. Repeatedly over the transcripts of 47 Pioneers, I could actually now, with the technology, do a word check on these two words and give you an answer one day how many times they appeared. And it was Go King Sui, our former, uh, um, the architect of Singapore's modern economy and our former finance minister, that got me on this job. And he later on asked me to do the same job for the Malay community and for the Indian community and for the diaspora in China. I said, sir, four years have given me a lot of white hair. I think you need to find other scholars to do the work. But it is a fascinating, and those who are interested come to me because the director for archives is right here sitting and just read and then see whether you would like to write about the other communities or continue to write more about these Chinese um, pioneers. It was Go King Sui who was so fascinated by this oral history, and he wrote a, a, uh, in, in the preface of my book, and he said, I quote, Honesty, industry, frugality are virtues, along with the clarity of vision and ability to act. It is only by virtue of every definite and highly developed ethical qualities that it has been possible for the entrepreneur to command and absolutely indispensable confidence of his customers and workmen. In this era where the, there was rule, there was no rule of law and, and nothing was binding, 
the people with moral character is paramount. Personal ambition was tempered by a collective sanction on the right and wrong ways of doing business, on what constituted good or bad business, on who formed a trustworthy or untrusty business partner. This is a quote from our finance minister who looked at transparency, accountability as paramount pillars for the success of Singapore's governance. Of course, when the book was published, he was the first one I gave the book to. Whether he actually read it in the end, I don't know. My research experience was a tremendous boost to fueling in me that sense of purpose and promise in business. I soon came to reckon, reckon that capitalism does not have to be, and indeed cannot be measured, only by one dim dimension on profit. We can ask more questions about the mission of business and how we do it is what matters. The invisible hands of the free market are unreliable as they are invisible and not there, requiring us to fix the visible structures and regulatory processes to curb the excesses while directing value creation in a way that benefits the community. And that insight is precisely what I do and KP and I do in our businesses. That while we safeguard the interests of a stakeholder, we safeguard governance standards and we also install, put in, in, in um, systems what is correct. It is so important. And the notion of a stakeholder's community gained prominence in my thinking and it's been since driving the meaning. And I feel this is all the lesson from Race Course Road, when mum asked me to bring food to Uncle Dore, the Indian uncle upstairs, and the, to the Indian barber downstairs, to Ibu opposite Race Course Road for the Malay community. I grew up in India, Ch Malay, and Chinese community all into one. In that sense, it's a truly Singaporean experience. So my mother was my first teacher on ethnic respect and compound values. My belief is sustainability. Um, this is a chart that I have used now to, for, and it's going to be for the next five years, I'm going to write more about for the academy that I am now directing within the group. I'm taken on for the last five years of my retirement years on coaching in the management academy on these important tenets. It's, uh, it's, a very, it's based on a very Confucianist approach. The green one, it's innovative. In the analex, there were only the first two, then the last two. The first one is about self-cultivation, then it's about family, then it's about state, and it's about the global, the world. But I felt they forgot entirely the middle area, the community sector, which is messy, large, uh, people power. And that's where we play. That's where our companies play. And that's where it's so important to be the interface, the bridge between families and state. So in the, there's a whole lot of uh, philosophy and, and work that goes on these five tenets. And that's where I just wanted to share with you that I do believe in self-agency, but I do believe that the self has to be contextualized in the family context, and the families have to be contextualized in the community context, and the community is part of the solution for the state. It's never going to be so easy. It's, it's also no point being opposing, but you can stand up to speak on it, on any issues, but remembering always the context of what you say. One thing I learned about being an NNP the four years, Claire says one view, somebody else says another. As long as there are three persons, there'll be three views. And it takes a long time even to sort that out. The differences of views in a family, my family has only 10 of us, even to choose a place to eat can take a day. 
So I, it was a humbling experience for me during in my NNP days and in all the work that I do in business development, working with the governments and the state enterprises and in negotiating our differences, that my view is only one view. All the skill sets I need to learn, that we all have to learn how to navigate the differentiation and differences to arrive at, at uh, harmony or consensus. It is a tremendous important skill set for Singaporeans. We are in such a fantastic uh, position as a little city-state in four civilizational confluences, the Malay, the Indian, the Western, the Chinese. We have such a heritage of ideas and passion and histories and memories that we could share with all these four civilizations and we can serve as the interpreter and the bridge makers and brokers for these influences. And we should use it. But 40% of our young people under 35 when interviewed said they do not want to work overseas. We have such a great opportunity because China does not see us as Chinese. China sees us as Singaporeans. Americans, the Europeans see us as East-West synthesizers. I feel that we should maximize on our heritage being not so West, not so East, but being Singaporean. What that means, find out for yourselves. But we are what we are. And we do have that value to service the world. And no other country in this globe has this opportunity as a little dot with all these influences. And you can feel that palpably, you can feel that when you come arrive at Changi Airport. I travel so much, so I really know when I go to China Airport or when I go to a US Airport. But when I come to a Singapore Airport, the internationalist perspective, the feel of modernity, of doing right, doing the right things, of transparency, all that governance is all there. It's, it's, a, it's a very good feeling, and I feel that it's going to be better. I therefore will take a break here. I have given a, uh, a snapshot of the, my 40 years journey and from academia to entrepreneurship, from community activism to parliamentary politics as a nominated member of parliament, from bohemian individualism to raising three children and to building a business with my husband and finally to being a grandmother of three today. It has been a journey of many turning points transitions and many revolutions. It was not always peaceful. It has not been all, I shared earlier about the miscarriage, but in the business, we went through 1997 devaluation of the Thai baht that nearly took us over. We earned in Thai baht, we borrowed in American, US. So you can see the exchange. Then we had the SARS, we had uh, bird flu, we had WTC, the Twin Tower, we have the coup, we have the whole load of things that through no fault of us, the business was completely done. Yet in the end, it was our 12,000 associates in the world that stood by us, went through the difficult times, took unpaid leave, and weathered through. Uh, good evening, Claire. I'm John. Thank you very much for your sharing of your various stages of life. Very interesting. Now, if you do have a chance to come back to this world again, at which stage of life do you like to come back to and why? Every stage, I think, has its brilliance. If I have the choice and only one, which stage I would like to come back to, I think when I am 40. 40 to 50, because you would have done with children, although I must say I have a third child at 42. I remember I lost a child, and by surprise, I had a fourth child at 42. Everyone says, no, don't have it, but I kept on. But I think 40 to 50, or 38 to 50, or if stretch it 40 to 52, will be the 10 years I would like to relive again with the wisdom and the tools and the emotions that I have now. Therefore, it's a moot question 
life cannot happen like that. We all go through the full hardy ways, you know, and every time we look for different stages. But I would like to choose that because I will, I would like to then, uh, I will do different things, I'll write more books, I will uh, um, spend a lot of time different things. Okay, we'll take another one at the corner over there. Good evening, Claire. I'm Joe. Uh, in your opinion, uh, how different do you think are uh, those born of the pioneer Medica generation as compared to young people of today? Do you agree that uh, young people nowadays are more self-centered, more selfish, uh, less resilient, right? And uh, also having less empathy for the unfortunate and downtrodden in our society. Uh, by the way, I'll just make a casual remark. I like that, that music accompanying your slides. It's a Cantonese music, uh, something like uh, 有情, something like, 只有情永在, something like that. Right? Uh, I like that song, thanks. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I think there's a lot of attack on the younger people being selfish, self-centered, a little time. But I do spend time with young people in Singapore, and among them, there are those who are very dedicated, very selfless, and good volunteers. So I, I think we shouldn't generalize. Uh, I'm at the stage of my life when I don't look at the negative commentaries anymore. I look at strengths. I go for strength finding rather than go for SWOT analysis. I go for what people are good at and what I can use them for and how I could pick, how could I fit them for a purpose. So it's not a question of whether or not they are selfish and not contributing. It's whether we know how to use them properly. So I do give a chance to, uh, to look at adults, how we guide, how we motivate, how we lead. Uh, even in companies now, we think that as bosses, we can tell the young millennials what to do. I, got what I called one millennial and asked for an assignment. I asked, where are you? She said, I'm in Starbucks, three o'clock in the afternoon. I said, what are you doing there? Thinking. <laughs> okay, thinking. Um, she's thinking about the assignment that I gave her that she has to produce, so she could not think in the office. She has to think in Starbucks, and she's alone with the computer to produce. I said, okay, uh, can I see it when you come back? Sure. So she did. So we are beginning to see that people like us as bosses of the Medaka generation, which to these young millennials are right old, there is this notion called reverse mentoring. I have to stop judging what they are good at what I'm good at, and to just listen what they want, how they want it, in order for me to optimize their talent. So I could take a decision, tell her to come back right away, and tell her if she repeatedly do, do that, that, I have to fire her, or I will have to see what her results are, and if she fits for purpose in what, she, what I do, or what the company does. So we need to be a bit more flexible now in the way we govern, in the way we manage. Again, therefore, it points the way towards us adults doing a little bit more in motivating the young to get them onto our fence. So I think there are a lot of goodwill. I think there's a lot of courage also among the young people. There's definitely a lot of misguided ones too, but it does need, we, we do need, the adults do need to relearn how we motivate. Hi, Claire. Um, I'm April Hu, and I have two questions for you. Um, my first question is, I'm a I'm Chinese-American from California. I've been in Singapore for almost 10 years. And your talk was very inspiring about the beauty of Singapore in its integrated society. So my question to you is, myself as a, in a way, as a foreigner to Singapore, how can I better be in a more, uh, to, to gain and learn about the diverse society when the, when the days of the kampong is no longer. I actually find Singapore not, not like the kampong days that you talk about. I'm envious where you could go upstairs across the street. As, as I come here, I don't see that. So can you teach me? You don't find that Singapore do? is too friendly, you mean? It, it, no, it is friendly, but it doesn't have the diversity. It doesn't have the kampong feel that you ah, talked about. Okay. So here I am as a foreigner. I've been here for ten years already, but I still feel, I still feel quite. Uh, I don't feel very connected. I don't see the Singapore that you talk about. That diverse, colorful, integrated Singapore. That's why the title is called Bedeka Spirit. 
Medeca was the year 1950, and we are there for about you know, 70 years ago. So the way I created now my Medeca spirit, mm. and that's what I taught my children, and I taught some girlfriends, is to create that Medeca village in the mind. I do not need the physical place of Race Course Road. I do not need Little China. I do not need Gelang Sarai. I do not need that. But I can group a network of friends I like or who are like-minded, who share my pathos, my, my, my passion. And they are my village. They are my kampong. It could be you from China. It could be somebody else from uh, America, somebody else from the state, all over globally, and who are with me in a village sharing with me ethos through WhatsApp, WeChat, Twitter, etc. And we can do things together, we share. I think it is beyond possibility now of having a physical kampong. If you have it, you're lucky. You stay in HDB flat, you might have it for a row of houses. But you stay in a private estate, it is harder. I, I, every year I try to invite my neighbours around my estate, nobody comes either. It's, it's very much people are busy and they do their own things, and, but you create that. And it is, if you at, engage yourself in more of the local organisations, you will find that. So the first thing to do, join Shireen Foster Programme in SMU. <laughs> or Chinese Chamber. Or an organisation. Just wet your feet and join any organisations to be a network member to start off. Because if not, it will not come to you. So I think it's a lot of just mixing and give it time and all that. So then my second question, Claire, which is, um, which is, your, which is your opening question, your opening comment that the future is of, is of the women, for the women, by women. And there I ask again for your, your, your wise guidance is that um, Currently, the world is not is 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 not held by women. At the moment, for instance, the number, the percentage of women on board is less than ten percent worldwide. This is women in senior positions is really low. So I ask you, you how, how do you how do you feel to, for especially for women at the age forty? You know that was a very interesting comment. I it, think it's, it's a taken for granted. Women are really busy. You know we we are taken we are. We bear the full brunt of family, of children. So right now, and I'm at that age of you know, ready to do something, ready to, to, to go on. So what would you advise? What, what about taking uh, a... I, I, would, I would say the first thing is on your own self-clarification as to who you are and what you want. I think any help you want to give to others has to come first from the clarification of accepting yourself in the circumstances you're in first. And I think there's so much to do and it's never ending. And there is, is, there will, is that forever challenge to think that you can create that difference. It takes a network, it takes a community, it takes a district, it takes stepwise effort, it takes influence, it takes maybe a, uh, uh, sometimes a huge protest, I don't know, but it takes a group to get things done. But we have come a long way. It was not, it was 7% at board level. We are now at 13. And uh, at uh, management level, Singapore is very, fairly good, close to about 50%. Inevitably, judging from the statistics, women are living longer than men. Women's education are much higher now than men. The world population fertility has come down, so women as a resource is going to be scarce and important. The world cannot deny the woman value, but it then begs the question, are the women ready, prepared to step up and step forward? That has always been my issue. They want, but they don't want to step up or step forward. And because they can't. They do have older parents. They, they, they do have a lot of worries. It's a male world. They don't want to spend time fighting. Psychologically, they're not confident 
to take that role. So it takes time and it takes our not giving up, continually looking at the goalposts and working the network and helping to get there. It was, it's better than 10 years ago and next 10 years will be better. And by the time my, my, do, my granddaughter saw it, she'd be flying to the moon. So that's the only hope I could imagine. But we as the adults cannot give up on being the influencer. Continue to talk it and push it and speak it. But more important, be confident in yourself. Thank you. Unfortunately, we can only take one last question, probably from, yep. You can ask three questions at the same time. I see I would like to answer all three. Okay. Hi, Claire. Thank you for taking my question. Uh, how about entering politics? Because I've always likened you to the Hillary Clinton of Singapore. Um, the other thing is, many young women, when asked what's the most desired qualities in their future partners, they, they say that the sense of humour ranks higher than wealth and social status. But I think that's a very tall order for our local people here. So what's your advice for them? Okay, Claire, maybe yeah, we just take all the questions first and those that Claire can answer shortly, yeah. she'll do that. Uh, Carmen, can you pass the mic to Jasmine? Hi, you mentioned about what teaching in village. Uh, so what, uh, can you elaborate more? Like, what is the topic they need and uh, who is the point of contact? Thank you. Thank you. How come all guys, huh? Okay, I'll come to... Hi, Claire. I'm very intrigued by your history. And I'm just wondering whether you and your husband would collaborate to write a non-academic book under the title, Why Not Us? Because I'm intrigued by the, your, the question that actually changed your mindset, why, why not me? But then you and your husband have, succeed, uh, have succeeded globally in many, many areas. So a, a book would be fascinating. Why not us? Last one. Okay. Hi. The younger one. Oh, can I ask? Hi. Oh, yeah, you can go first. Yeah, sorry. Uh, my question was, um, are there lessons that you think you have learned specifically because you are a woman? So you brought a female perspective to your experiences. Uh, yes, hi Claire, my name is Tony and I um, want to set the context that it's although you place an emphasis on doing the right thing in business but maybe it's very easy for people to think they can get away with not doing the right thing so what would you uh, say to other business leaders to encourage ethical behaviour in business? The easiest question, the person who wants to go and teach in the school, Jojo, Jojo, where are you? She's a contact person. Anything you want, that's Jojo. The second question is on humor. I totally believe in humor. And in a lot of my talks, I do mention humor as a very important medicine. As it is lacking in the men, just now they all, all laughed quite a lot, right? <laughs> so maybe it's, it's not us not able to know how to make them laugh. There's one. As to me being Hillary Clinton, no, it is too tiresome, no. Uh, I, I do not think any time we can be and we should be or we want to be somebody else. You are the best gift in life that your parents have given you. Respect that. You are the capital in life, of life. Sharpen that and respect that, treasure that and be the best as you can be whenever. As to the how to teach people to be ethical, tough, um, we have gone through many, many battles in different countries where our transparency and the way we work totally went headlong with people who work differently. We walk away because it's, it's different jurisdictions. We can only influence by doing the right thing ourselves. So when I, I'm in the business of retail, I, I run 80, 80 shops, I buy the millions. And I've always asked, do you want a second book? I said, no. You report exactly how much I pay you, I will be taxed as much as I pay you. So what you need to do is your seller You have to walk straight. People around you will then know that you are walking straight. You, you self-select each other. 
those who do not walk straight, you should walk away from them anyway. So you don't have to try so hard. And there are pockets of people in this world who are good. Look for those. So don't fret yourself to try to change the bad hats. Eliminate them. And why not us? Uh, it's in the making, but not maybe in, but not in, in the, uh, uh, that question. I've come up with my, my first book was on stepping out. And then it was in a Chinese version. And then it was Teng Lu, my biography. KP has written a few books, A Drop in the Ocean. And uh, we, we, we both, we, we like writing. My family is a family of write, writers. So we will be thinking of writing about travel and reflections and, and sharing that. And uh, your question, that, that's the last one, right? I answered all the questions. Give me a woman's view Woman's perspective, is that a different... I like to think, I like to think um, that I am both male and female. <laughs> and you, the Hua man, <laughs> should start to think you are both male and female too. Why? The male and the female are principles of thinking and acting. They are just skill sets, repertoires. You know, like a man, right? You always think Xiong is man. Not true. Xiong can also be woman. But I could be very gentle like a woman, but I also see very fierce woman. So what is male or female? So don't dichotomize. We artificialize human emotions and sentiments by creating these gender stereotypes. Try to work it out. So I fit, for fitting a purpose, I can be really purposeful, fierce, my eyes are shooting fire when I negotiate. But I can be very gentle when I am with a different set of people. So not that I am hypocritical, it's just that we have learned to acquire a series of skill sets to fit for purpose that situation. It would be, I've given away the notion, be you, be me. How can? You're a society person. I can't be. I can't be just Claire. When I walk to, a China, to China to negotiate, different psyche. I walk into parliament, also different. I walk to um, a, a male, totally male Chinese chamber, 99 years, no woman, suddenly Jack Claire comes. And then what, the first thing they say, beware. <laughs> I said, say, no, I'm from aware. <laughs> so, so every situation is going to be different. You just need to learn the repertoire, how to respond, how to react, how to embrace, and target at what you hope to achieve. How do you cut it to achieve it? There is the woman's perspective in the way we view society. There are values that we are different. So those matters, and you should speak up on them. And that's why now we have got women at board. Because the way they connect the dots and how to run the business or how to manage the associates can sometimes be different. But I also find men who think like us, and there are women who do not think like me. So I started to put away what is the male or the woman perspective so rigidly. I try to harmonize the viewpoints, the differences, and be sure of I know as the leader of the group what I want, what's my vision, how do I think, and how do I act to achieve and lead. That's why I don't talk about leadership, I talk about leading people. And leading people is all about developing their repertoire and setting their aspirations right and ensuring that it's teamwork. Charisma, leadership, women's leadership alone, male leadership alone are no longer sufficient. We have to work on team leadership where we all fit as a puzzles to create the goal because the world is moving far too fast and the world is far too complex. VUCA. Volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous. 
We need many, many helping hands, many, many thinking minds, male, female, to tackle it. So be the organization person, male or female, and sharpen the skill sets and the thinking power. All right, and then let's put our hands together for Claire.